Well, I want to thank you for joining us tonight on our Tuesday Bible study. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you again for your blessings today, and we ask you to be with us in our lesson tonight. It is going to be a challenging night tonight, and so we ask you to guide and direct our path. For you ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, you heard my prayer. I'm going to be asking quite a bit of you tonight, because we are going to be taking a look at Genesis 22. Now, sometimes in our Bible studies, you know, we give some of these nice light and fluffy lessons, things that challenge us maybe a little bit, but change the way we think about life, give us a good feeling about ourselves, about our neighbor, and that's all fantastic. Today is going to be an incredible challenge because this lesson appears to be the most immoral lesson in the entire Bible. If you were to ever talk to someone who is an atheist, they will tell you that this is the number one reason why they believe the Bible is full of hooey and junk and why they would never follow your God. They don't even want to listen to you. Because in this lesson, God asks Abraham to sacrifice his son at an altar. Now, here's what we do as Christians. We Christianize this. Well, this is a reference to Jesus. You have to understand, the Jews didn't live with that idea that this would be a reference to Jesus. This was a lesson in their Bible that they had to struggle with for a thousand years. And I am here telling you today that the United States of America is filled with people who are atheists because of this lesson and because of how you and I have responded to this lesson. We just kind of dismiss it. We Christianize it. We try to make it and gloss over it. We read it sometimes in the scripture in our uh, continue, right, continuing reading of Genesis we read over it. There are a lot of churches that don't even read this in church because they don't even want to bring up the embarrassment of this lesson. It's too difficult to deal with. But I'm going to deal with it tonight. And we're going to have to put on our thinking caps. And I'm going to challenge you because I'm also going to start with this. I know that there are many Christians who say, I don't know any atheists. I just have a simple faith. I believe the Bible, and so what's the big deal? The big deal is you are surrounded by people who are atheists because of you. You may not know any atheists, but you probably know people who are atheists or agnostic today because you didn't have an answer for this. You have a simple faith. I'm here to challenge you with your faith today because somebody else's relationship with God depends upon you understanding the Bible and foregoing that simple faith of yours and putting your big boy and big girl pants on and start understanding. Somebody's eternal life depends upon you understanding this lesson tonight. This is why this is important. Like I said, you may not know an atheist, but you know a lot of people who are atheists, probably because of you and me because we didn't have an answer for the love of God that is within our hearts. As I said, this appears to be a very immoral lesson. I will tell you, as I've mentioned before, I spent a 10-year period of time of my life on the verge of agnosticism and atheism. I was more of an agnostic. I wasn't sure what to believe about this God. This lesson very much troubled me. Now, I can't say this would have been the reason for me to reject God, but it was certainly one of many. How can we reconcile our view of a loving God which did, with such a despicable request by God that Abraham sacrifice his son? Now, I want to start with some critical background. But before, I want to give you some hope, first of all, to this. I've worked through this. I've thought and I've prayed through this. I will tell you today, I'm not here to weaken your faith. I'm here to strengthen it and to give you a reason to hope in the God that I love. And I hope that you love as well, too. If you're here and you doubt, if you're an agnostic or an atheist, I hope this is helpful. So let's take a look at about the critical background about Genesis chapter 22. Because again, I think one of the mistakes that we Christians make is we take these little vignettes, these little stories in the Bible, and we take them out of their larger context. But the book of Genesis, you must take as one book 
with one particular context, with one particular point it's trying to make. Now, there might be some subpoints, but there's one theme going through the book of Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, what we call the Pentateuch, that ultimately is tied together certainly by Jesus. But before we get to Jesus, you have to understand these people who wrote the Bible were not stupid. They had a perspective that they were trying to communicate. And Genesis isn't just a cramming together a bunch of stories about ancient guys. There is a particular theme and a reason why the stories are structured the way they are structured. And so it's important that we just don't take this lesson, the request of the sacrifice of Isaac, out of its larger context in the book of Genesis. And so we begin, oh, with Genesis 1. Okay? So in Genesis chapter 1, we know this is the book of creation. And um, in the book, and the story of creation... Oops, creation, creation, you can almost read that, I have such crummy writing, don't I? So Genesis 2 goes with Genesis chapter 1, if you don't understand Genesis chapter 22, in the context of Genesis chapter 1, and you have no clue what I'm talking about, you have an immature faith, I'm asking you to grow up, understand that you have to understand this request in context of Genesis chapter 1. Genesis 1 begins with everything being in sync and being in order, in perfect harmony in relationship with God. Everybody is at peace with one another. We are at peace with God. We're at peace with one another. We're at peace with creation around us. We are in shalom. So that would be the word of Genesis chapter 1. We are at shalom with one another. Ultimately, Genesis 1 is all about God. The most important day of creation is the seventh day of creation in which God rests in the midst of God's people and everyone is at peace. There's a problem. By Genesis chapter 3, oh, I should put it in, I'm going to put it in a different color. I've got all these beautiful little colors here. Violence enters into this beautiful universe. This is the whole point of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. From a Jewish perspective, violence has entered into the world. How did it get here? What is God going to do about it? This is what Moses ultimately is all about too. That's why the book of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy are called the books of Moses. Moses is the focal point where all of this comes to fruition in Jewish thinking. But it starts with the acts of violence. So we know that the world is not the way it should be. What happened? And so Genesis 3 starts laying out a foundation for the violence that exists in this world. All of the stories in Genesis are stories about violence. Now, it's not because they're celebrating violence. It's because this is the way of the world. It's trying to give you a very true look at how the world operates. So don't mistake the violent stories of the Bible with a statement that God is somehow condoning these. On the contrary, Genesis 1 is the intention. All of us at Shalom. Violence, unfortunately, is a result of human activity. So it explains it right there. It's not something that just happens. It's not because other gods perpetrated against us. See, that was what other religions taught. The other gods brought it to us. Oh, no. Violence is caused by human activity. This is a really profound thing for something that was written 3,000 years ago. Think about that. Everybody else was blaming the gods. In the book of Genesis, they're saying violence comes from us. We are the cause of it. Woo! Oh, how do we get to this? Hold on. This is so exciting. The stories of the ancestors about God's attempts, therefore, to reconcile humanity, to put an end to this violence, or at least to hem it in. So Genesis is all about a no-violence book. How is God going to get rid of this violence? God makes many attempts Many attempts in the book of Genesis to put an end to this violence. Oops. 
Oh, isn't that? Okay, I see what I'm doing. Genesis chapter 9. These are chapter numbers. These aren't number numbers uh, like 1, 2. This is chapter 1, chapter 3, chapter 9. So again, creation, everything's in Shalom. 3, violence centers in the world. God's attempt to deal with this violence. And this guy named, do you remember him? Noah. And so the world is mostly destroyed and no one his family are saved. Here's the amazing thing. I want you to point I want to point this out to you. In verse 3, something really unique happens. God makes an accommodation to human violence. God realizes that God cannot just destroy the entire earth and destroy all of creation without destroying humanity and God loves humanity but understands that if God is going to somehow live with humanity, God's got to make some type of accommodation to humanity's violent tendencies. So in chapter 9, verse 3, before Noah and his family, in creation, humanity were, humanity were, the man and female, man and woman, Adam and Eve, they were vegetarians. For nine chapters of the Bible, they're vegetarians. And all of a sudden, chapter 9, verse 3, God makes an accommodation. Okay, I will allow some eating of meat. That's not God's will for us because remember, our purpose is to care for creation and God's animals do. They have a place on this planet. We are supposed to be good stewards of them. And eating an animal is not good stewardship. It just isn't. But it's an accommodation to our violent tendencies. God isn't done yet. This is just a stopgap. God has a bigger plan. Until we finally get to chapter 12, this guy named Abraham. Abraham is going to be the source through whom violence ultimately comes to an end and peace will be restored and gifted to the entire world. But you, the problem with Abraham is that Abraham himself is a violent man. The problem with Abraham is that Abraham himself is a work in progress. He's a piece of work, that's for sure. He's a mess. But we're going we're, we're gonna to look at what a mess Abraham is. It's just unbelievable. He makes a mess of things too. But God is bound and determined that God will, through a mess of a man, through a violent man, bring peace and an ending to the violence of this world. So again, I want you to keep this word, violence, in your mind. Everything that we're talking about, every story in the book of Genesis is all about violence perpetrated by humanity and what God is going to do about it and how God is going to put an end to it. So let's get into some background about this Abraham. Okay? He was a violent man. He was a wealthy man, a violent man. He was a man from Mesopotamia. In Mesopotamia, I want to give you a little bit of background about that. They worshipped gods, many gods, but the chief god in Mesopotamia was a guy named Marduk. And you're like, what does this have? I mean, we're so far away from sacrifice. This is important. If you don't understand that, you can't understand the request of God to sacrifice Isaac. You can't. Jews understood this. We don't. We Christianize it all. Stop Christianizing the Old Testament. It's not a Christian book. It's a Jewish book. Okay? And they had an understanding of this background, that Abraham would have come from Mesopotamia, and where the chief god was this guy named Marduk. Marduk established himself by violence. How did he do it? Well, see, there was an, a goddess by the name of Tiamat. She was a little bit ticked off. I don't blame her. Her children were killed. Okay, her children were killed by one of the gods because they were tired of her children running around and creating such noise in the universe. And so they killed her children. Oh, you, 
Nothing like a woman enraged by the death of her children. Look out. She decided to go to war with all of the gods. And they're afraid that they are going to all die. This guy, this young upstart buck of a, a god says, I will take care of her. I will get rid of her. And if I get rid of her, my cost will be being the chief god of Mesopotamia. So that's, that's what happened. And so he comes and with violence... He cleaves and kills Tiamat in half. Kills her. Her body is destroyed. And I know you're saying, why do I need to know this? You have to know this. Because everybody who read the Bible knew this story. You don't know this, and that's why you don't understand the Bible. This is important. Tiamat was killed. He, Marduk cleaved Tiamat in half and killed all of her uh, followers. Through violence, he established himself as the chief god. Do you get this? This is important. You don't understand this. You can't understand what the Bible is trying to tell us. You can't. You have an imperfect, incomplete understanding of the Bible. This is all behind the violence uh, that's taking place in the book of Genesis. Now, I, I will tell you, for those who are atheists, you maybe have heard of this book uh, called the Enuma Elish. Yeah, I've read it. You should read it. It's an important book. It's a story about this. It was dramatized every new year in Mesopotamia. Abraham had probably heard it over and over and over again. But the Enuma Elish, the purpose of it, it was a political statement about why the king had the authority to rule. And so it was always a new year celebration. And so his authority was established by the violence of Marduk and cleaving Tiamat in half. Oh, by the way, I didn't mention this, I think. But Tiamat's, when her body was cloven in half, that became the foundation of the earth. It is her, so we're walking on her body, according to Mesopotamian theology. Okay, this is her body. It was now made for us, for humans. But humanity and earth and creation was made out of violence of Marduk against Tiamat. The king's authority was established by this violence. Yeah, and this sounds crazy, but don't we do the same thing in the United States of America? Isn't that why we tell the stories of the Revolutionary War? Our country was birthed in violence. We set off fireworks every 4th of July. That's a pretty violent act. We do the same thing today. Unlike Marduk, remember, you must understand this if you were to understand Genesis chapter 22. Unlike Marduk, the God of Abraham doesn't believe that violence is the way to establish the universe. In fact, let's go back to Genesis again. Chapter 1. You must understand that Genesis chapter 22 goes with Genesis chapter 1. When God created, well, God ordered. God doesn't really create in the book of Genesis. Matter already exists. The universe already exists. God takes a chaotic and crazy universe and brings order to it with a simple word. Remember the theme of the Pentateuch and ultimately the Bible is how is God going to get rid of the violence that exists in this world? And so one of the things that we notice in chapter 1, verse 2, I'm going to read it for you. Great. In the beginning, this is chapter 1, 1, God created the heavens and the earth. That's actually a bad translation when we put the word translation, uh, create there. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. The deep, foreboding, ocean. This is what it refers to, the ocean. Fear was a place of fear. Guess what word 
the deep is. Who did Marduk defeat again? Tiamat. Oops. In Genesis chapter 1, Tiamat pre-exists, but unlike Tiamat of the Marduk story, she is not a supernatural being. She's just chaos. She's the deep. She represents chaos. And how did Marduk create the universe? By violence. But how does the God of Abraham create the universe? With a word. Let there be light. And Tiamat is ordered. Her chaos is ordered. God doesn't destroy Tiamat. God orders her with a simple word. You see, there is something so profound being said here, and because we think Genesis 1 is all about six days of 24-hour creation, it's not about six days of 24-hour creation. There is such a profound theological statement being made here that the God, our God, doesn't create by violence. Our God creates with a word and brings order out of chaos. Oh, I hope that's something important to you in your life. Because your life right now is chaos. With a simple word, God will bring order and peace to your life. God is not Marduk. He doesn't win a victory by violence. He wins the victory by a word that brings peace even amongst the deep. Tiamat, the one of violence. Do you see? The author of Genesis is really a smart guy. He is communicating so profound to us how God, the God of Abraham, is not a God of violence, but a God of peace. Oh, now we're ready for Genesis 22. So how do we fit Genesis 22 within this context of a God, oops, that's a two, who doesn't want to bring violence. And we've got this request for child sacrifice. This just seems so at odds with everything I've just said. I want you to remember Every time you read a story in the book of Genesis, I want you to ask yourself a question. Why is there violence? It's caused by humans. And what is God trying to do about the violence? That's the question you need to ask when you approach every single passage in the book of Genesis, because that's the theme of Genesis. How is God going to get rid of the violence that we have brought upon this world and how is God going to reconcile these relationships? Now, the God of surrounding cultures, the ancient Near East, Marduk himself, often expected child sacrifices. Sacrifice your firstborn to prove your intention to follow God. This is what Abraham grew up with. This was the life they grew up with. A world that was surrounded by people who believed in child sacrifice expressed your commitment to your God. But what was Abraham's journey? Abraham, remember, he was an imperfect being. He was a violent man. He was a work in progress. And so God asked him to do what? Leave all of this behind in Genesis chapter 12. Leave it. Don't stay in Mesopotamia. Leave it. That is both literal and figurative. Leave all of your baggage, all of your understanding about religion, all of your understanding about who the gods are behind you. Now we get to Genesis chapter 2. This story where God is asking Abraham to sacrifice his son is exactly what Abraham would have expected. But remember, God is asking him to 
leave all of that stuff behind. This story in Genesis chapter 22 is included here so that we can understand that the God of Abraham is different than Marduk. And any gods would establish religion and faith by acts of violence. It is important that is included in the Genesis chapter 22 because there were still many people who believed that human sacrifice was an appropriate activity. So what better way to demonstrate this, how abhorrent this is? Jews would read this and say, this is abhorrent. A God who would ask somebody to sacrifice their son, that's abhorrent. It's immoral. The Jews knew it was. And so what this is included in the Bible for this reason, to demonstrate to them why it's no longer important for us as Jews to participate in these immoral acts that the surrounding cultures were finding themselves in. Because our God is not a God of violence, but a God of peace. Genesis chapter 22 is a rejection of anyone who would try to establish a covenant and a relationship with God through blood of violence. It's a rejection of that. So it does exactly the opposite of what I think people say. So people look and say, oh, I can't believe God would ask us. No. The whole point is to demonstrate how immoral a thing this is. And that this God, the God of Abraham, rejects the blood of sacrifice, the blood of humanity, or any violent act as a means of establishing relationship with God. That's why this book and why this is important that it be included in here. So let's take a look at this verse by verse. We're just going to go through a few, not verse by verse, just a few things. We've gone a long time already. So Genesis chapter 22, when Abraham is asked by God to, to, to go, here it is. These things, got, and after this, God tested Abraham and said, Abraham, see, Abraham is, again, a work in progress. Abraham doesn't get or understand. He's asked to leave the gods of his past. He's asked to leave Marduk, but he still doesn't get it. Remember, Abraham is still a man of violence. For him, for God to ask him to sacrifice his son, be okay. Yeah, that would be from my culture. God is trying to draw a very big distinction, but my love of you is not based upon anything you do, and I have rejected violence as a means of establishing relationship with God. Abraham hasn't learned this yet. He's still immature in his walk with God. And so God is like, oh, this guy has done some really stupid things. Abraham has done, okay, I'm going to write this down. Abraham, Father Abe, has done stupid things. He's done a lot of stupid things since the 10 chapters in which he was called to follow God. I mean, stupid, stupid. Oh, Abraham, are you so dumb? I told you I'm different than everything else. I don't establish my relationship with violence. Abraham still is too stupid to get it through his thick head. So God says, okay, I'm going to show you what I mean. And so I'm going to ask you to sacrifice your son. Not because God ever intended that to happen. Because I'm trying to demonstrate to you that my faith is something completely different. Normally, and like I said, Abraham was stupid. He did a lot of stupid things. Oftentimes when God asked Abraham to do things in the ten chapters prior to this, he was combative in his response to God's request. He had doubts about God's requests and the promises God made to him. He confronts God about God's attitude towards Sodom and Gomorrah, a place of violence again. And he still doesn't get it. In several circumstances, Abraham hedges his bets when it comes to God's request. So God asks him to do something and he reaches for a human solution to thorny problems. He doesn't, he's a work in progress. He's a man of violence himself. He doesn't get this new God. He doesn't get it. Abraham lies about his identity with his wife while he goes to Egypt in order to protect his life. He's stupid because he doesn't trust God. 
Abraham wants to adopt. Well, you know, he, he's promised by God that he would have a son to Sarah. He says, okay, well, I'll take her, his ma her, her maidservant. I'll have a baby uh, through her because obviously, you know, my, my wife just can't do it. Okay, so he has, a, he has a son. And that son, so he tries to take matters into his own hands. All right? And adopt an heir to be, uh, to fulfill God's promises. So he's a child with his servants, with his, uh, his wife's servant. Once again, Abraham, for a second time, lies about his wife to Abimelech in Genesis chapter 20. Time after time after time, Abraham is stupid because he doesn't understand who this God is. <clears throat> Finally, Genesis chapter 22, I think there's something that happens to Abraham here. He finally is starting to get it. God asks Abraham to sacrifice his son. And Abraham finally resigns himself. <sighs> Abraham has learned that when God makes a promise, God will fulfill that promise without Abraham's help. Abraham knows that God, that Isaac is God's promised heir. And so God never breaks a promise. So I don't know what was going through his, his, his uh, head at that time. But here's the interesting thing. I want to read verse 5, up to verse 5. So Abraham, he, God said, Abraham, here am I. Take your son, your only son Isaac, and the one whom you love. Go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering upon the mountains of which I shall tell you. Remember I told you, God is not a God of violence. Abraham's too dumb. He doesn't get it yet, though. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his ass, took two, his two, two of his young men with him, and along with his son Isaac, and he cut wood for a burnt offering. And they arose and went to the place where God had told him to go. And on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place far off. Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the ass. I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and we will come to you again. It's a little more clear in other translations. Translations here doesn't make it as clear. Abraham was talking that, tell, told the servants that my son and I will return. Did you hear that? He expected, he wasn't lying to them. He was saying, you know what? Yeah, I'm going out here. God's going to provide. God's going to provide. And my son will come back with me, and he will be living. So whatever the thought process was going through Abraham, he finally just decided to trust the ride that he was on with his God. Whether it was a miracle that he was expecting, but he is finally figuring out that the God of Abraham is not like Marduk. He's not a God of violence, but a God of peace. And God will reconcile with us somehow. Now, one of the things I want to point out to you is about Isaac. And this is probably not the image that you have of Isaac. You are probably right now imagining Isaac as, I don't know, a five-year-old boy. Four-year-old boy, five-year-old boy, six-year-old boy, whatever it is your image is. That is just not accurate. That is not what the Bible says of him. And that's not what the Jews believed of him. The Hebrew word that's translated as boy is more literally lad. Well, when do you become a lad? <laughs> you don't become a, a little lad. I mean, a little lad, we think of it again in a different way. But remember, did you notice that, that Abraham actually called his servants by the same word, lads? They were, they were, they were probably 20s and 30s. It was a word that was used of servants. And it was used of the servants who traveled with him. It was the same word, lad, was used of the spies who scouted the promised land of Canaan. So it is clear that Isaac, he's no child. He's not a five-year-old boy. He's a young man at this point. We, we see this. This is certainly the way the Jews thought of this. And Josephus, in the Antiquities of the Jews, he believes that Isaac was... 25 years of age. Now, the Jews, they think, that's pretty young. 
They actually, and the Jewish Midrash, which is a commentary on, on Genesis, it states, and, and Rabbah 56.8, you can look that up, but it states that he was 37 years of age. So he's not a little five-year-old, six-year-old boy. The Jews didn't even think of that. Isaac was hardly this innocent, unwilling participant in this. He knew what was going on. He figured it out. In fact, we were told that he carried the wood that we used for the burnt sacrifice. He knew what was going on. He could have easily walked away from his father and said, Father, you are stupid. He didn't. Because they trusted that God would provide for them. However God was going to do it, God was going to provide. And we learn in verse 12 that ultimately, take a look at this. So Abraham put forth his hand and took the knife. He was going to slay his son, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, you dummy. No, that's not what he says. Abraham, he said, here am I. He said, don't lay your hand on this lad or do anything for him. For now I know you fear God. You have not withheld anything, not even your son from me. God doesn't allow harm to take place. Because you remember, the God of Israel is not. Oh, I lost my red. I don't know where the red is. Oh, there it is. God, the God of Israel is not a God of violence. God doesn't establish relationship by the use of violence. Unlike Marduk and the surrounding cultures. Now do you see how important this lesson is? God provides. This lesson ultimately is not about Abraham. It's not even really about his faith. The God of Abraham, unlike the God of Mesopotamians, does not establish covenant by sacrifice or violence with the murder of children. This lesson is a critique of Mesopotamia and the surrounding cultures. This isn't the way of your God, Abraham. Grow up. Because the God of Abraham is not a God of violence. That's why this lesson is so important in the context of the Bible. To prove that this God doesn't do things this way. God's provision is always waiting for us. And so ultimately this lesson, you know, the place where, where that goes on, the Bible lesson goes on in 22 and says that Abraham names his place. Now it isn't, the place isn't named Abraham has performed. That isn't what it's called. It has nothing to do with Abraham. It has the name that by which it's called is the Lord will provide. You see, it's all about God. It's not about Abraham. And the God of Abraham is a God who doesn't establish things through violence or through blood, but through love. Wow. have to understand what this meant to the Jews, how this story is within the context of the larger story of the Bible. It's not a little vignette that is eight, we are able to take out and say, oh, this is an immoral thing. It's a, vin, it's a story within a bigger story. But what again? How our God rejects the use of violence to establish his covenant and his relationship with us. I'm going to end it here. I have attached, I did this as a sermon a little bit differently because I didn't have uh, a lot of the beginning part. In fact, most of what we did tonight is, was not a part of the sermon I did on this lesson. But there is actually a, a section about what we learned from this lesson. About how, how God is a God of promise and not a God of violence. You're welcome to read that. I'm going to attach that handout uh, to, the, uh, to the link to this lesson for today. You're welcome to go ahead and download it, use it, read through it, however you want. But I want you to grow up in your faith and your relationship with God. I want you to put aside these childish things. Oh, I just need a simple faith in God. No, you don't. God wants to grow you up. 
Why? Because somebody else's faith depends upon you maturing in your relationship with God in the same way Abraham had to mature in his relationship with God. A simple faith in God was not sufficient. He had to reject his Mesopotamian culture and the violence by which his faith, the faith of his ancestors, established their understanding of God. This God of Abraham is a God who rejects violence, a God who comes to bring us love. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we, this is a tough lesson, but God, I know that there are many people I know who've rejected you because of this lesson. It's often because we as Christians take this story out of context. We just accept it as a simple faith. Oh, well, it's just God. There's a reason why this was asked of Abraham. And ultimately, the story is about your rejection of violence as a means to establish relationship with us. So it really says just the opposite of what we get out of it sometimes. But it's important for us to mature in our faith. Why? Because maybe the folks here tonight don't know any atheists, but I guarantee you they know a lot of atheists in making. And so I'm praying that you would help us to have a deeper faith and a deeper relationship with you. So we understand what you are trying to communicate to us through your scripture. We just thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Remember, God is a God, not a violence. God is a God of peace who establishes with a simple word, takes the chaos of the universe, establishes his order upon all things. May the God of love and peace go with you now and forever. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.